Well, awesome. So I know we'll have some more joining us for the folks in the room that are new to this call. Um, I'm Jody Palaha. I have been involved in the Research and Evaluation Committee for many years, as has Jeff and Astrid. Um, the th uh, a few of us on the call are part of a leadership council right now. We may have others joining from that leadership council. Um, and the Leadership Council is trying to organize monthly calls that explore different important topics in research and evaluation that could be of interest to our membership. And this is a one-year exploration during which every month we look at something new and interesting in the area of research and evaluation. Um, for example, one month we heard about health policy research. Another month, we heard about setting up a practice-based research network. Uh, another month, we talked about um, hiring a private uh, or collaborating with private research firm to do um, research in healthcare industry. And so every month, it's something a bit different. And what we're doing on these calls is we're hearing about that topic, learning about that topic, certainly asking questions about that topic which we'll be doing today. And then in the last 10 minutes or so, we're asking more big picture questions, like what do you think our membership would like to learn about this topic? And how could we, as a research and evaluation committee, do a good job of disseminating this type of information to the broader membership? So it's two goals today, one, to learn all about something, and then two, to think about how to spread that knowledge to the larger membership. So what is that something? Today, that something is um, <clears throat> a really cool topic that we've never heard about before, um, which is lean uh, and Six Sigma um, processes and how those relate to continuous quality improvement. And it turns out that CFHA was lucky enough to recruit um, Flo uh, Gerber, who's on the call today, to work with some of our partners and then attend our Boise conference and get involved in our organization a little bit and then be willing to lend her knowledge and expertise to our membership. So Flo is an MBA. She specializes in continuous quality and performance improvement. She's been in leadership positions all around in healthcare, uh, serving in everything from project management to quality advisor type roles. She has more than two decades of operational experience in all different kinds of industries, but importantly, healthcare. And she has a lot of passion around how to use these processes to improve effective and efficient approaches. So I'll let her talk more about the work that is specific to healthcare today. I'm gonna to pass it off to her to give a 20 to 30 minute presentation We'll then take questions specific to lean processes and quality improvement. And then I'll cut us off a little before the hour so that we can talk more broadly about how this information might appeal to the broader membership and how we can think about bringing and infusing more of what Flo knows to everyone. And with that, I pass it to Flo. And I know, Flo, you probably have slides today. I, I do have slides, yeah. I'll and, share my um, screen. Yeah, you have that, so you're good to go. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Well, I feel very privileged to be here with all of you. I am on the Pacific time, so it's a little bit after nine o'clock. Um, so as Jody had mentioned, I've been doing this type of work for over two decades and totally passionate about it. Um, so here's my contact information if you need it. And what we're looking at so go ahead and advance my slide here. Um, the key takeaways that I will be presenting today is what it means to have a culture to think lean. And what does this mean as a quality improvement um, organization adopting this philosophy? I'll talk about some key lean QI tools and techniques. There's a list of them that I'll be sharing, but only target on a few in this presentation. And then I'll provide examples of healthcare organizations that applied lean and improvement outcomes in regards to their 
approach and really adopting it within the organization. And then we'll do some Q&A and wrap up. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So here's a little information about myself. Jody provided um, a little bit more and then what's on here. The one thing I do want to say is at one point I did transition out of healthcare and worked for Fortune 100 and 500 companies. And interestingly enough, when I went there, I realized, oh my gosh, why isn't healthcare doing this? And this was in the 90s that I did this. I got out of the industry, really learned a lot about operations, operational excellence, what does that look like? And then I brought it back into healthcare and applied those methodologies. And that was in the 90s. So total quality management system, you know, thinking quality improvement, um, and I also implemented Malcolm Baldridge. And back in the 90s, I said, I don't know, but it feels like eventually in the near future, healthcare is going to have to shift how they perceive approaching healthcare operations to really be more effective and efficient. So fast forward, here we are now. And um, all the information that I've been able to apply has been beneficial in my career and how individuals and organizations have tapped my knowledge. So I think that's a key component because Lean actually came from Toyota Production System. So the history of Lean, I'm not going to read all of this, but, you know, as I mentioned, it was a, a, a philosophy from Toyota, Toyota Production System. And right here I have highlighted. Um, Joseph Duren, engineer and management consultant that worked with Toyota um, as, law, as well as with Deming. Um, this particular expert said, you know what? He saw a link between healthcare and manufacturing industry and quote unquote, as the healthcare industry undertakes change, it is well advised to take into account the experience of other industries in order to understand what works and what has not worked. Hence, here we are. Um, IHI has really embraced Lean and has promoted it. I want to say that. Um, and one of the examples I will provide you came from IHI and their white paper in the two organizations that were early adopters of Lean in their organization. Um, so this next slide that I'm going to be sharing, my bad, and here we go. Um, it's a framework. There's a lot on here, but in general, when we look at organizations, it's based on a system. So on the right side, you will see boxes that are in green or light green. So that's the high level, you know, what the organization is about, mission, vision, values, the org chart, et cetera, looking at internal and external customers. And then on the bottom, what you will see is daily operations. So in healthcare, that would be taking care of our patients in the clinic. On the left side, you'll see what is quality management. So quality management, there's three components of it. There's quality assurance to make sure that, you know, whatever we do, the services we provide meets customer satisfaction. And then in order for us to make sure that's happening, we have to have a sense of monitoring or controlling to make sure that we are actually meeting customer satisfaction. And if not, this is where quality improvement comes in. And what that means is redesigning for customer satisfaction. As I mentioned in the previous slide, daily operations. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. And what it's saying is in this particular framework, there's customers that have needs. And on the left side, I defined what internal and external customers are. Internal customers from a business perspective are individuals that have been employed by the organization and they play a key role in how we take care of our patients. External customers are individuals that also play a key role in how we provide service to our patients but they're not implied, but they're very essential. The reason this is very important is when we're looking at processes, which is what you will see in yellow. So you have your customer needs, like our patients, suppliers, vendors, community partners, government, if we interact with them, there's a process that happens 
and specific tasks that need to happen. Within the process, there's roles and responsibilities. And then the outcome is really looking at it to say, are the customers happy? Did they meet what our needs are? If they did, then we'll sustain it. If not, we'll have to do some quality improvement. In the middle of this, which is pretty standard, is when you have the process, there's measurements and reports and key performance indicators that need to be available to really determine what's happening here. And if it's not meeting target from a process perspective, how could we evaluate and determine where there is inefficiencies and where we could actually target initiatives? Okay, so the lean philosophy, what is this? Well, here are the key components of it. Really supports daily operations, focusing on identifying what are the customer values, internal and external. Patients have specific needs that they have, whether it's getting access, but also ex external customers, such as our, our community partners. They'll have their own separate needs and really understand collectively, what are these needs and how we, do we take this information to make sure our processes meets those needs? So the key processes are exactly what it is. What are those daily operational tasks that need to happen? Are there processes that we are actually doing that we don't need to? Are there processes that we're doing that actually add a lot of inefficiencies in how we deliver the care or the service? So once we look at the key processes, then we determine, okay, what are different wastes? Now, waste is a term that lean um, and Toyota production system uses, but really it's looking at the whole process. You've identified the key process, but looking at it to say, okay, are these adding true value to the customer needs? If not, then that's a focal point to evaluate a little bit further. And if it's reasonable based on conversations, initiatives will be taken into account and really creating a quality improvement, continuous quality improvement initiative project. And that's where the redesign of processes come in. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's a list of tools and techniques for improvements. And this is what lean methodology uses. And the ones that are have an, a red arrow are the ones that I will be focusing on in today's presentation. So we have the philosophy, okay, organization says, yep, we're gonna focus on, on our internal external customers, processes that bring value, redesigning it, using performance and indicators to determine how we're doing. And then at the same time, continuously do what we need to do to meet those needs. So now it turns into the culture. So the culture is a systematic approach. Now these are behaviors ways we're gonna approach issues, but we're gonna look at it through the philosophy of lean. So what the culture is saying is in lean, the number one asset is people, human side of the organization. In my training, we looked at finances, profit and loss, and we look at the line item that says personnel. Though in the profit and loss or financial um, statements, it says, hey, we have personnel that's an expense. They're actually the biggest asset. And this is internal and external customers, particularly internal customers. So we need to tap into the people that do the work to help solve the problems and not have it be driven exclusively by management and upper executive levels. So once you have the culture, there's the operations and how we do the daily work. So with this culture, staff feel safe and engaged and take part in the improvement initiatives because we've identified based on the processes, there are certain parts of it that may not or are not effective and efficient. Now, it doesn't stop there. It's not just staff feeling safe or engaged. It also is a culture where managers have been trained to teach in a lean methodology, to mentor and facilitate collaborative conversations. 
And this is the key to meeting the first thing that I mentioned, which is the people are the most important thing when you're looking at improvements for any organization. If you have these two, then what happens is we could streamline processes in, in, and as a result, cost reduction, improved quality, time of delivery, and increased customer satisfaction. Let's see here, let's advance. Oh, not able to advance here. Okay. So as the last slide specified, we're gonna go ahead and um, look at how we can streamline processes. So the continuous systematic improvement approach is that follows the left side, provides a little bit more information about what quality management is, and it ties into the slide where it was a triangle, a triad. But the continuous systematic improvement approach, you identify internal customers, how to measure it, you study the data, and then you go, yep, this looks like, yeah, this looks like we're not meeting it. Are there processes? What are the processes that link to it? And then you approach it through a plan, do, study, act. Now the plan, do, study, act is actually the scientific method, which we're all familiar with in grade school when we learn science. And the plan, do, study, act is when you identify an issue, an opportunity for improvement, you plan. And a lot of the work is done in the planning. Who's involved? What's the process? Kaizen events, which I'll tap into shortly. And then you plan and then you do. Okay, if it's a theory, if we, if we alter X, Y, Z, we're going to go ahead and do what we plan. You study it and then you act. What worked, what didn't work, and what opportunities for improvement. And if it looks like, yep, the changes in the process actually benefited um, the whole even a little bit, okay, then that means there are best practices that we could incorporate and continue to do. Um, so at the system level, okay, system level is at the top level, big decision makers, they identify an improvement initiative or a project, and they say, okay, great, we're going to do a Kaizen event. So you need an individual that is a continuous systematic improvement practitioner with technical and interpersonal skills to facilitate these conversations. And it's individuals that are cross-functional that affect the processes or actually are part of the process. I've done Kaizen events where we actually brought in patients that are affected by it to get their input on what can be improved. Um, so this is where project management skills come in. You put a charter together. In my experience, uh, I have worked with project managers that actually did these types of work. From my perspective, the missing element when they do project management is exactly what I'm presenting today, which is looking at it through a quality improvement lens. Project management helps drive all the tasks that need to be accomplished and it is very beneficial to have someone that has the skill set to look at it through the um, improvement lens. Um, so when we are in the work group sessions, we process map, <clears throat> we look at the current state, identify opportunities for improvement. We collectively look at an improved state and then there's a web work plan. Um, you go ahead and implement it, study it. And then when it looks like, yep, this is what we wanna go ahead and do, then we'll go ahead and find ways to sustain it at every level of the organization. So what's process mapping and systems thinking? Every process has a start. So when I do Kaizen events, we need to be in an understanding of what the start process is. The gray arrow shows that when there is a process, it affects other parts of the organization or other systems. So we look at it collectively. Does it impact human resources? Does it impact facilities? Does it impact um, risk management, finance, accounting, et cetera? And then we identify what the end of the process is. This helps scope out and really focus on the process flow itself that we are going to be tackling to improve. Hence, to increase and improve measurements. And the goal is to meet or exceed what that target is. On the bottom, 
our wastes or opportunities for improvement. So as we look at the process from start to end, we'll identify certain things that are inefficient or ineffective. The way I help describe what this is to clinicians is when we, as clinicians, I'm not a clinician, but when clinicians look at an individual, there's certain symptoms that come up that are indicators to say, well, the body's not working the way it should be, or it could be improved. And that could be cough, that could be a fever. Well, in the organizational system, it's the same approach. There's certain symptoms that present themselves. And when the symptoms are presented, how can we further analyze, evaluate, and determine what the root cause is? On the left side, it says lean acronyms. What they used is downtime. After doing this work for several years now, it did not translate very smoothly to healthcare. So I went ahead and updated it and I came up with improvements as an acronym, I-M-P-R-O-V-E, to help identify what the waste is. So I stands for inventory. What are items that are not used or random or um, not used or rarely used when you look at the process? If you see this, that's a symptom. So let's investigate a little bit more. M is movement. These are items that shift or individuals that travel from one place to another. That's causing waste or an opportunity for improvement. Personnel is unused knowledge, skills, and abilities. And this is the biggest waste, I will say, in healthcare is that we have so much knowledge with the people that work within the organization. Let's tap that. Let's bring them into the Kaizen process to really determine what their knowledge is and be part of the solution or co-creation of an improved process. The next one is R, is if there's any repetition or if you have to redo work, that's another symptom. O is on hold if anyone's experiencing wait time. If there's wait time within the process, that is definitely a symptom. If there are various steps, or different approaches that people are doing to do the task. And the last is E, which are errors, receiving or actually giving wrong information. Okay, so overview. Um, number one asset of any organization is the people. Let's tap them into the initiatives and the quality improvement pro um, process, Kaizen events. They're there to help us look at things from a different light. They're the ones that do the work. Let's hear what they, their voices are. Um, when we look at it from an organizational perspective, you have quality management. That's the lean philosophy and culture where we look at the mission, vision, and values, the strategies and operations, and then determine, okay, what are these operational tasks that we're doing? Are we meeting customer needs? Okay, that's assurance. Are we finding ways to control it or monitor it? That could be data. And if they're not being met, what is the QI process? So you come up with a continuous systematic um, improvement project. You look at the system level, prioritize those initiatives, create CSI projects. Then it's improved. It's gone through the PDSA cycle. Yep, looks good. Let's go ahead and implement it to the teams. They implement it, and then you come up with a sustainability plan. And one thing that I'm going to add here, um, and it's called the improvement board. So this is a best practice that I've done in healthcare where, okay, we need to sustain this within the team. How do we do this? And in lean, um, there's many ways that this is termed in healthcare, but um, what we're looking at is an improvement board and the improvement board really is a visual of where things are. So I'll show um, an example of what the improvement board looks like at the end, okay? But really what it comes down to is leading by example as well to make sure that the philosophy and culture are embedded and adapted. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, I would provide a couple of organizations. Um, if you type in, <laughs> Virginia Mason Medical Center, you'll find information on the internet about lean as well as theta care. These are the early adopters 
So in 2002, um, they, when I say they, Virginia Garcia, started implementing this within the whole entire healthcare system. And their results, the, these are three of many, but I just wanted to highlight it. Decrease in wait time for labs, increase in productivity, and um, lowering inventory costs. Uh, Theta Care, here's a couple, th oh, actually four things that I wanted to highlight when they started implementing this, improved productivity, increased gross revenue, and reduced time for patients that are referred to treatment. And they ended up being featured in Fortune 100 companies, uh, best employers. Now, what I'm gonna show you now is an actual, um, I'll say continuous improvement project that I did. And it is with primary care and it's pediatric and family practice teams. So I'm not a clinician, so I am there to collaborate with the clinicians and the subject matter experts. So what this organization identified was the fact that, hey, we are not meeting immunization rates per guidelines of the state, okay? So they wanted to improve the process. And what they looked at is saying, you know what, we need to generate reports to monitor these, um, these activities that are happening. We're gonna use Epic as a way to get the information. Um, and then we have to actually, by compliance, utilize Alert IIS, which is a state of Oregon database where information is entered. And that provides individuals that are using this particular, um, uh, let's just say library. And when they look at the information, it'll tell the user if a specific individual has or has not met their immunization rates. Um, and then, you know, we need to contact patients and their parents or legal guardians and get them part of the process um, to make sure they're up to date on immunizations. <clears throat> um, and then one thing we also determined was, are we doing any outreach strategies? Okay, well, these are things we have to look at when we're looking at processes. Um, so one of the things we looked at is how do we handle calls if parents or legal guardians return regarding immunizations that are due, what do we do about that? Um, how do we review patient immunizations? What are proper ways to administer the correct immunizations during the patient appointments? Okay, so that's really determining, here's a process, we have data, we're not meeting it, we need to be in compliance per the state, we're a federal qualified health center, yeah, this is a priority, how are we gonna do this? And so when we're looking at immunization, you know, according to um, the recommendation, it helps protect children from common illnesses that lead to serious outcomes. Um, though vaccines may have side effects in general, they're really safe. So when we're looking at this, we also have to determine the why, why are we doing this? And then the target goal that we identified was um, for the children that are within the population we identified, we want the overall goal to be greater or equal to 80%. Then once again, who are the people that are involved? So we created a Kaizen work group with front desk individuals, panel managers. Panel managers are individuals that actually read the information, the reports to help the clinical team determine, okay, I think this person's missing immunizations. Um, so they're there to really be a support from a data perspective. Then you have the provider support, the CMA. The CMA or LPN are the individuals that actually administered the immunizations during the client visit. Then you have the community health nurse and the primary care physicians or providers. Now, when we do a Kaizen event, we use process flow. Now these are um, standard shapes that I use when I create my process flow. Circles and ovals are start at end of the process. Squares or rectangles are the process steps themselves. And within the process step, you might have very detailed information that needs to be accomplished. We create job aids for those. And then if there's a decision within the process that is signified by a diamond. And the challenge here is ideally to have that question be a yes or no answer. And then if there's opportunities for improvement, you could create a cloud or just put a starburst. And this is an example 
of a Kaizen event um, and what I did. <laughs> so I don't have the circles or the rectangles, but I do color code it. The ones that are in blue are actually the process step. Um, the ones that are in a sticky, which is pink and it's a diamond, that's a um, decision point. The ones that are, I believe in green are job aids and everything in yellow are opportunities for improvement. So this is very telling to say, yep, there's so many inefficiencies here within the process. Where are we gonna actually tackle and prioritize the work? So that's a different um, tool that's used, the ease impact analysis to really identify and prioritize all these opportunities for improvement. So we did the Kaizen event. After that, we created the process flow. Now, this is a very complex process from when the patient checked into when they actually leave and then the um, activities that happen where they're, when they're not actually in the clinic. So here's an example of what we came up with as the process flow. It just was a, it's just a way to demonstrate how one could look. Um, and so here, the ones that are in green, those are job aids, and it gives specifics about it. We created a toolkit, and then it provides information on the pages that corresponds to that job aid. Okay. The other way this was actually um, presented was in a narrative. So this is a narrative to really explain, okay, here's what the process is, what are the descriptions or activities that need to happen and the role that it, uh, the roles that actually um, complete these tasks. Uh, so imagine we went ahead and did the Kaizen event. We came up with a new design. We used data and these are um, some of the clinicians and the outcome of the pilot. So if you look at it, the ones that are in blue lines, that's the clinician or the team. Um, and so for the one on the left, they were at 46%. We went ahead and implemented the new improved design of the process, monitored it, and it looks like, yep, we got something here. On the right side is another team. More providers went ahead and implemented this new process, and it still had an upward trend. So when we looked at the data and the trending of this, we said there's something here. So what we decided to do was, yep, we're ready to implement within the whole entire organization. Um, so we came up with an implementation plan. So the other thing that I bring into my practice is the science of change management. So there's, a, I use bridges. That's one of the models that I use. Um, but the key things is how are we gonna communicate this to the individuals that are being affected What's the process flow, roles, roles and responsibilities, and the key performance indicators to monitor the work? And on the right side is a toolkit that we came up with. Here's an example of what it looked like. Um, and it's a point of reference because on the left side, it says consider. When we implement something, we need to have a point of reference so that we have a common understanding of what the expectations are. To me, there's a specific stage that needs to happen. So once we create that standard operating procedure, or in this case, um, a toolkit, we train. And then what training looks like to me is the person that does the job actually shows what needs to happen, okay? Answer questions. Then the learner needs to practice it with a coach next to them. So if they have questions, um, they could go ahead and redirect them to the right um, tasks that need to happen. Then the learner applies it, still having that coach to be there if there's any questions, comments, or concerns. And then the ultimate goal is to sustain this new redesign of the process. And what I'll show you here is that improvement board that I was mentioning. This is um, a technique and an approach that I used within clinics. And really it's having someone at the team level, um, having a team identified. And on the left, um, it's tucks in the stages of group development. I'm not gonna go into detail about that, but really 
it's an improvement board that specifies who's on the team, who are the members, um, you know, how are we going to engage, what are the mission and value, mission, vision, and values of that particular um, team that aligns with the whole organization, mission, vision, and values. You're going to have the performance indicators, and those are updated to really monitor it. Um, on the right side, opportunities for improvement is continuous opportunity for improvement. So if others come up with opportunities for improvement, there's a place for them to put it. And then on the bottom are the PDSAs or the particular process flows that have been completed because we're gonna to wanna to celebrate successes, any of them that are on hold for whatever reason it may be, and then the ones that are active. So in this case, we would have the process flow um, under the PDSA active. Now this um, was a physical, physical board, but I've designed it to actually have it be virtual as well. Okay. So I'll stop presenting there. So now, after all that information, I wanted to say more, but I had to condense it. We know this you held an, back. Flo. I did. I did hold back. I tried. <laughs> but right now, the floor is open to anyone. If you have any questions or comments, this is what the time is for. Questions or comments? I have some, but I'll hold back. I'd love to hear what other people on the call wondered about during that amazing presentation. Um, this is Liz. Uh, I just appreciate this presentation so much and all the information and hopefully we can get um, a copy of the slides. If that, would that be possible, Jody? That is in the ballpark of Hannah. Oh, okay. Okay. Hannah, is there a way to um to push these slides out to the people that are on the call today? Um, I can email the PDF. Yeah, if you send me the PDF, which I'll put my email in the chat right now, um, I can send it out to uh the registration list from today. Great. Not a problem. And the recording will also get posted on YouTube pretty soon. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah, just one, like a couple things that I was um, thinking of when you were presenting was just how, um, like, thinking about operations and thinking about um, systems and just kind of thinking about things from a larger perspective is so important and how, um, like, it's great to have people in business with business backgrounds doing that. And also I just kind of wish that there were more clinicians who had had an interest or, you know, specialized in, in this type of thing. Um, that's just, that was just something that I thought because I, I was, I was messaging Jody. Um, I, I fortunately have a background in marketing for my undergrad, and then I also um, did an MPA along with my um, master's in social work. And so I kind of got some of, some of this stuff on how to lead, how to manage and operations and things like that. But I wish that there had been more of that um, in the MSW program, because I feel like a lot of my colleagues are kind of like, I, I want to get into that type of thing, but where would I even begin? The comment I have for that is I started this journey back in the 90s, as I mentioned earlier, and I just it just came naturally to me. So I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And trust me, in in my journey, in my profession, I implemented these methodologies and I got pushed back because it wasn't something that was practiced. But I just did what I knew, what felt right. And this is the latest. This is my prediction. This is gonna be the latest and the greatest profession that's gonna be out there that healthcare needs. Now, whatever they title it, someone will come up with a model. There's certifications out there to be lean, certified and what have you. The gap here is this, honestly, anyone could get a degree, anyone could get that certification. It's the practical application that is the most essential. Um, and I'll just say that, I'll just say it out there. You know, I've worked, I've pitched the idea <laughs> with organizations um, when I say organizations, academic institutions to say, look, would you like to have a conversation to actually have this be a specialty? Because it's new, no one's said, yep, let's think about this. 
So I just keep doing what I'm doing. There is no course out there to actually say, yep, this is it. I mean, I'm going to specialize in what this is and actually have practical application with the right coaching. There is there are courses out there that provide this, but it's not comprehensive the way one would need it to be able to perform and be a practitioner in this type of work. So that's my comment. Really good question. Other questions? You know, uh, several years ago, I, uh, as a student of dissemination and implementation science, which Flo, we've talked a little bit about, that's the sort of same sort of field of discipline, um, but it, it originated and evolved on the um, science side of the house instead of the business side of the house. Uh, if there's a house, I don't really know what that metaphor is about, but anyway. Um, and so using my knowledge from what works in implementation research, I created these champion teams and created a process by which these teams could engage best practices in quality improvement, which have, have a lot of overlap with what you were describing today, although is much less comprehensive. And what I see as the challenge here is like our methods were so much less comprehensive that they had a higher um, <clears throat> But like misfire rate where we we didn't do a million sticky notes so we might have missed some things and we didn't always have it all um, um, our hands around it all when we were trying to solve the problem but on the other hand we were able to solve quite a few problems and over the last five years or so we have run about 30 champion teams across a few different clinics and departments um we were able to solve quite a few problems using a very efficient 30 minute um, meeting style um, with you know, your integrated team that have different uh, stakeholders kind of working together using data informed decision, PDSA cycles, and just five or six of those 30 minute meetings. Um, and I think that that compromise, some sort of compromise of the two approaches because we're losing money every time we pull our stakeholders out of the clinic to, um, you know, attend one of these meetings. And our paid, like our hourly wage staff, like your nursing staff, front desk staff, et cetera, they don't get paid to do that on the, on the lunch hour. They don't get time away from those places. And so number one, how many hours does it take to train someone to do that's all money, that's all money revenue loss for the organization. Then once you get a trainer um, trained and you get them in there, how much time are they pulling people out of um, healthcare service delivery? H how much have you grappled with that flow and what kinds of compromises have you identified? Yeah, um, so the first thing I wanna mention is, I think the biggest difference as far as the approach that I've used in my practice is considering it from a business lens and cost is a big thing. And that's incorporated into the thought process. And I have had pushback with executives to say, oh, we're not a business. And, you know, I just kind of sit back because I understand their perspective, but it is a business. Are we looking at it through a business lens? So that's a whole science within itself. I bring in the business science into this. The second thing is, yes, because I have the business lens to it, money is always at the forefront, okay? The Kaizen events are technically designed to be consecutive days and redesigning together with the same people. There's, so there's continuity. In the Kaizen model, it's five days. When I work with my clients, I've knocked out the Kaizen event with implementation plan within three days, okay? A lot of it is me doing behind the scenes work instead of just diving in there, okay? So I have found ways to be more effective and efficient myself so that the Kaizen events are actually very, yeah. very clear yeah. and concise. It sounds the like reason you found some, some uh, shortcuts. 
Yeah, and the, this is where practical application comes in. If you truly just look at the Kaizen event, which is the model that they have with Toyota Production System, it's not going to work in healthcare. So through the decades, I've been able to adapt it. Okay. Um, so the key here is it's consecutive. Now, why is that the case? I worked at an organization and they pulled me in. They said, hey, Flo, we hear you get things done. And we've been trying to work on this project. It's been over a year and it's going nowhere. And I asked them, I said, how have their approach been? They said, hey, we have a team. We meet every single month. Action items get out of it. We meet the next time. And I said, oh, that's great. And that's typically what people do. What ends up happening is when you meet every single month and plan that, hey, this is going to be done in a year, what happens? There's inefficiencies. People are waiting because let's say that the meeting, someone comes in late and they're a critical component of the discussion. They're not at the meeting because they can't make it. Okay, so there's personnel that's a waste that we're not using um, and at the same time all the administrative costs to schedule appointments reschedule you eliminate all that when you do a kaizen event okay so it shrinks it down i got i recently have a client right now their funding has been reduced significantly and it's in healthcare and they said flo we hear you do this kind of work i need you to knock something out in about a month month and a half because we got to roll it out by july 1st okay we had our first meeting last month, last week, and we knocked out one portion of the process flow. And these are significant discussions that need to happen. They had to think about services to prioritize because they couldn't provide every single service. We looked at external partners, which is external customers. Who is it that we could refer them to? What's the referral process? Okay, right. so that I, I understand. Money is huge. Right. Right. So okay. um, if it's OK, since we just have about 10 minutes left, I would like to just transition to how what would you all like to learn more about if we were going to go into more depth, if there was an opportunity to do a half day workshop on this at CFHA's annual meeting in person or a, a longer webinar or a series of, of learning experiences, what and or speaking for your neighbors, what would people within CFHA broadly, you think be interested in that, that Flow could provide? I would love to hear people's thoughts on the broad application of this stuff to our membership. So Jody, let me add one more thing. Sure. Okay. In Lean, there's a concept called Lean Daily Management. So what I presented to you was a big system-wide implementation, but then there's these opportunities for improvement that you could do at the team level, that could be done within, as you said, 30 minutes, right? When I implemented the clinics, I had my huddles, what's working, not working, great, let's fix it right away, okay? So it's the philosophy that anything could be improved in the organization and finding time for it. And what Toyota Production System is saying is small improvements is big gains. But every single day, what is it that we could improve on? So it kind of aligns with what you were saying in implementation science, you have the big thing and then 30 minutes, we could do little projects. That is part of the lean methodology. I just want to throw that out there. System level, team level, and in, in, even as an individual, what can you do differently to make things more effective and efficient? And That's I got great. stories galore for that. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thoughts from the crowd. Yeah, I'll, I'll just chime in very quickly. I, I joined very late because of other meetings, but uh, no, I appreciate this this level of education, and I think it, you know, Jody, to your to your um, kind of point, I think the the easier thing to implement uh, after leaving a, an extended learning opportunity or whatever it might be, uh, the next meeting uh, might be most appreciated. Uh, so, kind of the team level, just having people understand that what's the easiest way to actually use some of these strategies. Um, rather than feeling like they they aren't at the C-suite or the leadership level that would be able to actually implement a, a more um, comprehensive or uh, labor-intensive uh, effort. Great thoughts. Other thoughts? Um, what would you benefit from if we could go into more detail or if we could do something a little differently, what would that look like? How would you want to learn more about this topic? 
flow. What thoughts do you have? If you had an opportunity to continue to work with us on programming for CFHA membership, like what are some things you would pitch? Uh, the first thing is, and I've done this before. I actually have um, one pager, it's called Cliff Notes. And it's using my model. You have that point of reference. I train, you all practice, you apply it at work, I'm the coach. And so that's pretty much the cycle. And what I've done in the past is we'll take one of those tools and then we practice it and then get back together. And it's like a learning collaborative. I think that's another way to say it, to say, okay, how did you feel about this? How yeah, do you feel cool from, from one to five, five like, yep, I got this to zero being nope. And then that will help determine if we move forward to the tools. It's about learning these tools. As, as you can see, there's a bunch of them, but I've gone to a point where the ones that are used the most is what I've been able to train and coach with. Okay. So the first thing, which um, may seem very simple is I came from business. So it's business 101 to identify internal and external customers, but in healthcare, that's not a common way of thinking. So let's kind of look at our business lens. And one of the practices that I did is, okay, let's identify and really understand internal and external customers. Homework for the week is just think about it. I mean, you don't have to write anything down, but think about it. When you're in your everyday work, look at that person. Is that person internal and external and why? Are they internal, external and why? Next, great. What are the, the customer needs? Okay, go back into your clinic. What are the... Just pick five people that you identify. So anyways, I've done this before because it's it's building these skills to the point that you actually put all these tools into practice. One tool may not be the right tool for another thing. Taking a few notes while I'm typing. Um, Jeff had a thought. Um, workshop where folks learn step-by-step -step guidance to apply this to a problem they are facing in their system. It's a great idea. Um, Hannah is just reminding us all that she will get the slides out to folks. Um, yeah, I, I hear you, Flo, saying that like some tools will help with this and some tools will help with that. So it's a little bit of maybe getting people to commit to learning a handful of them because they may not quite feel the, the vibe on one tool, but then they come back two weeks later and they're like, oh, now this tool, it's applicable for me today. And we all know that if it's not applicable for us today, we may or may not remember it six months from now or a year from now when it becomes applicable. But if we can use it now, today, then it's more solidified and then becomes part of our repertoire. It seems like it might take people a while to slowly grow those skills and it could be a a learning collaborative that people come and go from over time yeah i love absolutely. the idea eventually gets to a point where I'll, i've been able to introduce the basics i'll just say the basics to get to a point where you could actually do a pdsa cycle mm -hmm. i'm a firm believer that you start with yourself first that tells the story and then after you have practiced it on yourself what is it that you can do with your team? And it could be a team of just, a, to me, a team is anyone besides you. <laughs> so pick yeah. something that you do with someone and, um, and then you, and you just progress. And, and, and one needs to understand that it is about practice. I did not get to where I am overnight. I had to kind of pave my way in this career and it just happened to land where I am right now. Um, so there's no specialty out there in what I do, um, but the, the skills definitely are transferable and has really, really helped the organizations that I've partnered with. Really cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, we just have a couple minutes. Anybody have a question they want to ask? Yeah. So I know this is CFHA, which is, um, you know, behavioral health, um, same methodology I used. Um, when we wanted to launch um, primary care behavioral health in medical homes. So same methodology. And at that organization, I'm not no longer there, but the program is still going, et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. 
Um, Flo, I took a bunch of notes. I'm going to communicate all of this back to our uh, leadership council. As I mentioned, there were about four of our leadership council members on the call today. Um, there's another four or so that must be on vacation or something. We're getting close to that time of year. So, and Fridays are always, uh, you know, the beginning of the weekend. But um, I'm going to make sure they know that you provided us with a really great and applicable bunch of information today. Uh, we'll certainly want to. Once you get those slides to Hannah, disseminate those. And um, I really appreciate your time today. This was, yeah. I, as I expected, a really good use of the seminar series we're doing, this learning series. And um, thank you so much. You yeah, know, one thank thing. That, oh, sorry. This is Jackie, Amanda, and RL. Could you put your email address in the chat? Just I don't seem to have you in my system, and I want to make sure you get future meeting notices. Sure thing. Thanks, Jackie. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you, Jody, for inviting me to talk. Uh, I love what I do. I believe in what I do. And I, as long as you all want to hear about it, I'm here for you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank, thank you, you so yeah. much, Flo. Absolutely. Well, have, have a great, great weekend, rest of everybody. Week. Yeah. Bye. Thank See you. Ya. Bye, everyone. Thank you.